qualities that bubble and flow and rise up like mists and create fogs and barriers that are penetrated and then rain down in pixelated form with color-tinged nuances and resonances. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander Eth, and today we are talking about the Fountain of Wisdom with author and esoteric cartographer David Chaim Smith. David is a retreatant and is the very definition of a contemplative mystic. He's also an esoteric cartographer, someone who makes incredibly intricate esoteric diagrams, and he's the author on several books of contemplation and mysticism. David returns on the podcast in this episode to talk about his upcoming book, which is a commentary and translation on the 13th century text, The Fountain of Wisdom, one of the most challenging works of the Kabbalistic tradition. As David says, about the book, this rare work presents a labyrinth of psychoetheric symbols that map out the subtle atmospheres, textures, and resonances discovered through a unique radical style of contemplative mysticism. These strange and beautiful glimpses function as a powerful set of doorways in ways that no other Kabbalistic text comes close to offering. The original 13th century text is included in its entirety in a new English translation by Dr. Mark Verman, one of the preeminent scholar translators of this generation. David shares about the importance of the fountain of wisdom, how one can practice this incredibly intricate and powerful text, what contemplative mysticism really means, and so, so much more. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome back David Chaim Smith. David Chaim Smith, thank you so much for coming back on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Oh, Alex, it's a pleasure to talk to you about this subject because this text is one of the great joys of my life. I've been at it for 22 years with this text, and the publication of The Fountain of Wisdom in this form is the culmination of so, so much. And many of the points we've talked about in the past. And really, it, it brings together the full scope of everything I've done in this lifetime. So I'm very eager to get to it and incredibly happy about it. Thank you for the opportunity. For those who have not heard about this, Dave, what is the fountain of wisdom? Can you give us the broad strokes? Well, when you say for those who have not heard of it, that would be almost everyone because it's a very, very obscure work and almost nothing has been done with it. And certainly in uh, the realm of where your listeners would generally be familiar, which really pertains to Western esotericism and occultism, it's hardly been mentioned. In the Jewish world, it's been mentioned a little, but almost not at all. So when you're talking about Hermetic Kabbalah versus Hebrew Kabbalah, which is the basic schism that people adhere to in the field, neither side has dealt with this text. It's part of the deep past and history of Kabbalah that has had a strong influence, but that influence is silent. It's almost like people have purposefully ignored it. The Fountain of Wisdom is a text that comes out of a group that's usually referred to as the Iyun Circle or the Iyun School from the 13th century. Iyun just basically means contemplation, but the term contemplation is greatly misunderstood. It doesn't refer to thinking deeply about a subject in a philosophical sense, like pondering a subject, which is the conventional way that the word is used. Contemplation in this sense refers to mystical contemplation, meaning immersion within meaning so deeply that the self-identified mechanism of the ego disappears. And the Fountain of Wisdom is about 800 years old. It's a text that was popular at one time in a certain area of Southern Europe, but probably goes back to earlier oral sources. 
So just like the Sefer Yetzirah, we can't really say how old it is. We can only say when the first written copies were discovered, and they're about 800 years old. So it's a key text, major text of the Iyun school in the 13th century, and was still used intensely by practitioners of mysticism by the 18th century. As a matter of fact, it's a major text for the great mystic, the Baal Shem Tov, who is the founder of the Hasidic movement. He used it almost exclusively as a text in retreat to train his primary disciple, the buyer of Mesrich, called the Magad of Mesrich. And the weird thing about it, when you look at these manuscripts that are about 800 years old, that are scattered throughout various libraries, we're talking about a very short text here, just you know, a dozen pages or so. And there's one in the Vatican Library, there's one in the British Library, there's one in Jerusalem, there's one in New York, and all the versions vary wildly. So we're really not talking about a text like the Zohar, where it's pretty standard from manuscript to manuscript. We're talking about a fluid and flexible vocabulary of symbols that changes. And then you got to ask yourself, well, why? Why does it change from version to version? My contention is that it changes according to need. It changes according to the criteria of the people using it and what they want to stress. Like even just co basic correspondences, like one version will say there are seven of something and the another version will say there are five of that same thing. So, which is correct. Is it five or seven? This would drive occultists nuts. <laughs> and basically what it does is take the emphasis away from a straight correspondence language, like a language of formulas, which is what occultists are very often used to, and places the emphasis elsewhere. It places the emphasis on the way that the symbols are functioning and what they do within the mind. And this is something that we should really talk about. In your introduction, you use terms that I've put out to describe the vocabulary of the fountain of wisdom. And I use the term psychoetheric, meaning that what we do when we immerse within the barrage of symbology that the fountain of wisdom gives us is we attach our mind to the nature of these symbols and the mind becomes those symbols and those symbols take over the mind. In other words, it's an immersive experience. It's an absorptive experience. And the symbols themselves are not concrete symbols like we would have representational signs for things. They're more like textures and qualities that have literally etheric import to them like qualities of clarity, qualities of scintillation, qualities that bubble and flow and rise up like mists and create fogs and barriers that are penetrated and then rain down in, in pixelated form with color-tinged nuances and resonances. And the nature of this kind of symbolic vocabulary is so much like the mind itself, that it's almost like the imagination finds itself a new home in this expanded register of symbols and blends in with the intention of it. And the intention of it is to create a set of mental atmospheres through which the contemplative process speaks. And the text is extremely odd in the sense that it has no narrative order. There's no beginning, middle, and end. There's no process being described like you'd have in a 17th century alchemical text. It's a, an upsurge of these qualities, these textural psychoetheric symbols, which invite the contemplator to go in, but the text fights you because it doesn't say come in and go to step one and then step two and then step three and then you're on your way. What it does is it throws you in the middle of a confounding array of highly difficult obstacle courses that preclude logic and reason and the mind's need to get its bearings and orientation. So it's very, very difficult. 
The text has been included from time to time in short collections of early Kabbalistic texts in the religious world. And if you go into the house of a Kabbalistic scholar and you look at their bookshelf, you'll say Fountain of Wisdom, Mayan Kachokma, and they'll look at you like they don't know what you're talking about. And then you say, okay, we'll open up the text of short early pieces from the Baal Shem Tov. Like I said, this was a major text for the Baal Shem Tov. And in the 19th century collection of short texts and Baal Shem Tov's commentary, you'll find it there. But chances are the scholar who has this book on his shelf in the Haredia religious world has never opened that section, doesn't know what you're talking about. And when he looks at it, he's going to have the same reaction that an occultist would, which is like, I don't know what to do with this. Part of the reason is because this text doesn't use the regular Kabbalistic symbology that everyone is familiar with. It doesn't use the spherot. It doesn't use the worlds. It doesn't use the five levels of the soul and the tree of life and the spherot. I mean, that's how you get your bearings on a Kabbalistic text, right? So if that structure isn't there, what do you do? Well, the text is not going to help you. And it's probably for this reason that people have left it alone because no one knows what to do with it. When I first found it, I was studying with a certain rabbi. This was 22 years ago. And this rabbi had a lot of insight into the kind of practitioner that I was. And he didn't really know what to do with it either, but he wanted to introduce me to it. And we read it and looked at it and talked about it. And I was used to Tree of Life and Four Worlds, the tarot, you know, all the stuff that your audience would be familiar with. And this rabbi, Rabbi Alan Brill, who's um, from the yeshiva world, he said, look, no one has touched this. Sleep with the text under your pillow. This is for you. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, just, just probe it. Just see. Just see if there's a connection because I sense maybe there could be. It was a very insightful move on his part. I did sleep with the text under my pillow and I did read it and bang my head up against the wall of the text over and over and over. And I got nowhere until I started mapping it out. And what I mean by that is in notebooks, started doing diagrams, geometric layouts of the symbols that I could discern. But because there's no narrative order, there's no starting point, no culmination, I was lost. I could map out certain things and other things, but they didn't go together. And what do you do? So in my work of esoteric cartography, which is essentially Kabbalistic diagram making, Kabbalist and alchemical diagram making, general mystical diagram making, I incorporated the parts from the fountain that seemed to fit. And I worked with them for years, but no cohesive overview jumped out at me for the text. For a very long time, I could say that I used parts of the fountain of wisdom extensively in ways that no one really had ever done before. But to say that I understood the text, to say that I could navigate the text, uh-uh, forget it. Then what happened was that as the years went by, I got more and more pieces, and it took me over 20 years to cover all the parts and say, yes, I can account for all the parts. So the commentary that I'm publishing in this book is just an accounting of all my research and practical expression of this great, wondrous opportunity, which fights you every step of the way and doesn't want to be found, wants to conceal itself, actually. And in the process of serving the text, eventually I got to the point where everything in the text could be accounted for in some way. And I stated my ability to do something with it in the way that I did it in my commentary. However, I am not a scholar and I'm not a historian, and I'm not stating that this is the definitive solution for what the text means. I have no idea what people 800 years ago were doing with it. Well, I have some idea, but not really, because I'm doing something different. I'm only describing my work with the text as a contemplative practitioner now. So there are scholarly works 
There are practical works, there are traditional works, and then there are works like mine, where I can only speak from my own point of view and work with the text, which is extensive and has historical predicate, meaning parts of it do relate to other things and fit in into a wide variety of applications. And some of them are in the Jewish world, some of them are in hermeticism and alchemy, and certainly the type of contemplative work, contemplative mysticism that I do is largely alchemical, meaning it creates transmutational change that distills in essence, a quintessence, quint meaning five, quintessence, five essence. In other words, the essence of what the five elements do when they perform and are expressed. And the drawing of that quintessential nature from appearances and conventional sense of reality is what the text is actually about. So I consider it an alchemical text as well. You have a beautiful way of unweaving emanationism, of unweaving thought patterns, of unweaving constipated thinking. And I guess my follow-up question to that is, when it comes to the fountain of wisdom, you say that these symbols offer beautiful glimpses that function as a powerful set of doorways Dave, what are these doorways from a contemplative mystical perspective? What, what would you like the listeners to know about the doorways and, and how to approach the doorways? Oh, what a great question. Oh, I love this text and this work so much that when you get a question like that, I mean, you're really asking me about the great joy of my life. Like I said, the symbols in the fountain of wisdom are largely atmospheric, meaning it's not like just a simple concrete symbol like a number or a letter or a planet or something like that. They're more environmental. And by environmental or atmospheric, what I'm talking about here is a context into which what knows phenomena and what is known in phenomena, the knower and the known, the perceiver and the perceived, both can melt. In other words, the subject and the object don't conflict each other. They melt into a third option, which is this obstacle course of atmospheres and textures. And these atmospheres in the text are tuned to express what mind passes through as the ordinary sense of reality starts to dissolve. When the subject and the object stop their dualistic, conflicting, contrasting nature that fragments reality into a series of separate parts in time and space and location and concept and feeling and all the divisions that articulate parts in the barrage of chaos that becomes ordinary life, which is like a flip book, you know, like this part against that part. One moment against another moment, one place against another place, one thought against another thought, right? The mystic is looking at the chaos of the conventional sense of reality and trying to discover within it some cohesive unity. As the immersion takes place to try to discover that unity, these atmospheres come up. They are the qualities of the mind's own dissolving into what it perceives, now, let's start with a couple of definitions here, because there will be people in your audience don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Let's start by saying that the ordinary sense of reality that most people have is the result of an ordinary function of perception, that there is a general range for human beings, which is accepted as the status quo, that objects, physical objects are solid that they're surrounded by space, that time is linear, that concepts are individual, individuated and cohesive, and a person who perceives objects in space and moments in time is separate from the whole of things, autonomous and real, and that the reality of an individual person is integrated with the greater whole, but separate unto itself and individual and personal and unique. And that sense of personal uniqueness places the individual 
against everything else, pits the mind against the whole of things, which is this great conflict, this great gulf that seems to alienate the mind from everything else, which is infinite. So it dwarfs the mind. And the result of this alienation is a life of random fragmentation and alienation and, and conflict and sense of needing rescue in a sense, because it's frightening because you seem to be born like this and then you, it seems like you will die like this. And what is the meaning and value of a human life then if you're just this isolated dust speck blowing around, uh, colliding against things and meanings and surfaces between what the senses report and what the mind generates internally? So that's your ordinary reality for the most part is this incredibly dangerous terrain. What mysticism offers is a way of disrupting the mind's habits as the trajectory of mind is cultivated and refined. And the fountain of wisdom takes this trajectory that cultivates the mind's sensibilities and puts it through this obstacle course of these psychoetheric atmospheres or qualities. And the secret of it is really that at the core of perception is pure awareness. And awareness is pulled through degrees of subtlety by the process of contemplation. And the word pulling is extremely elusive because who is there to be pulling the mind? How can the mind pull itself? Where is it pulled from? Where is it pulled to, right? To and from and the one pulling and the thing being pulled are all conventional conceptual designations. So we're not talking literally that there is something being pulled by someone, but certainly there is this weird pulling that happens when the mind starts to be aware of itself. When you can think about the fact that you are thinking and feel the fact that you are feeling, there is an awareness of something that was taken for granted before. It was almost as if something that was asleep is starting to wake up. And once the mind starts to become aware of itself, it can be refined. The mind's awareness of its own awareing function, if you want to use the word awareing as a verb, when the mind starts to be aware of its awareing, it pulls itself from nowhere to nowhere. And this is a very, very elusive thing because people can either relate to the mind's refining of its own sensibilities, clarity, sharpness, brightness, or they can't. And this is a process that's really only for very few people who are even interested in words like this. Most people would hear what I'm talking about and they just simply would not care, which is fine because if you want to live in an ordinary reality and function in an ordinary manner, no one is stopping you. To want to do what I'm talking about requires that you be a kind of a freak and want to take yourself from the general status quo of the human realm and all the realms and essentially refine awareness itself. And by the term awareness, I am not talking about awareness as the psyche. I'm not talking about the individual stream of perception. I'm talking about awareness itself in the divine register, meaning the quality of clarity and brightness and knowingness that is not limited to the brain and the nervous system or to an individual person or to a group of people or to habits and patterns that are collective in the unconscious of the human realm, as Jung would say. I'm talking about the aspect of awareness, which is purely divine, that is equal to what Kabbalists call in Sof, the divine as such. And this is a pretty bold statement, because if you could equate pure awareness with Ensof, which is beyond comprehension, and you pursue the realization of that, that's the mystical path. The basis of the mystical path is to always be bound to the highest, always be bound to Ensof. The word Ensof, En means no, Sof means limit or end, no end, the infinite. If you are bound to the highest, infinite, essential nature of reality, you are bound to mind's most intimate essence. 
And this intimacy is what the fountain of wisdom articulates as the layers of reification and division start to dissolve and the mind passes ever deeper into its own mysteries. These atmospheres are not external objects that the mind encounters. They are the synergy of the mind in the midst of its functioning. So we're not talking about perceiving or something that is perceived. We're talking about the confluence of the subject and the object dissolving together into this great unity. This is the essence for me of what is referred to as the great work. I'm sure you are aware of that term, and I'm sure your listeners are as well. Well, yes, okay. indeed. And I think there might be some listeners out there, Dave, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, who might say, oh, yes, I understand what David's saying. I mean, you know, many uh, hermetic texts and many other texts talk about uniting one's mind with the highest. And before I engage in a ritual, I connect myself and I do visualization about, you know, uniting my mind with the divine light, let's say. If, when people are doing that, what are they missing? What are the what are the things that are that are not being emphasized? Because what you're talking about seems to be a complete dissolving of the quote unquote average or quote unquote usual or quote unquote day to day way of engaging with and perceiving reality. Well, I'm certainly not going to criticize or cast aspersions on anybody or their practice, but if there's a target for the arrow to hit, then you've missed the mark. You know, what we're talking about here is essentially dissolving into a bright nothingness and open lucency, which is the ground of all phenomena. It doesn't make the world go away and it doesn't make your display vanish. However, it changes the meaning of that display. It's a matter of meaning. It's a matter of the mechanism and the habit of self-identification. If there is a you to self-identify, set pitted against all things, then the mystical process has not even begun. So, what happens when there's a you pitted against everything else? Well, the you is going to suffer. The you is going to feel misery and suffering and alienation and be beset with qualities of negative reactivity in emotion and all sorts of mental registers. So if the great work is complete, there is no suffering because there is no individual to suffer. There is only the divine. So the end result of the process, what we're shooting for is gnosis, is divine realization. If somebody claims they have divine realization, I'm not here to judge them or say whether they have or whether they haven't. I essentially don't care. This is for each one alone. This is not a cultural activity where we're judging the progress of the path of others. This is something that is so intimate within a practitioner's own life that the only claim that has to be scrutinized is the one we make within ourselves. And we should never claim that we've reached the goal. The goal is forever. The goal is always. The goal is constantly beyond beyond. So, the goalless path is its own reward. So, if, if somebody says, oh, yes, like you said, I bind my mind to the infinite before I do my lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram or whatever it is, my only question is, well, how's that going for you? <laughs> because there's no discussion, you know. I mean, I'm uh, I have my own practice. Everyone has their own practice, and I put out these books, and there is no follow up. These are tools, and the tools are there to be used. This is not a place to make judgments. That is a deeply personal issue of your own progress. That is out of the hands of someone like me to comment upon. But having said that, occultists and Orthodox Jews and everybody involved in Kabbalah from all sides, Jewish, Christian, Hermetic, all the different sides, uses a common language. And generally, that common language in this day and age is the tree of life, the spherot, and the context in which the spherot functions as a way to calibrate and 
categorize and structure the work is generally with the five registers or five contexts of activity referred to as the worlds, the five worlds. Generally, many occultists will know four of them and a a four world system is used, but there is a fifth that is in Kabbalah as well, different styles. There are also five general levels of mental functioning or consciousness referred to as the five levels of the soul. And when you put these two together, you get a kind of a ladder, a kind of a hierarchical structure. What knows is calibrated as the five levels of the soul. And what is known, the context in which knowing takes place, is referred to as the five worlds. This ladder gives you a hierarchy of provisional states or relative states or states that change based on circumstance. What I'm offering with my view is not limited to this. Provisional circumstance, where you are placed and how change articulates degrees of subtlety, is only a means to realize an absolute essentiality. And so is equal in all rungs of the ladder, in all the modes of knowing of those rungs of the ladder. So when the emphasis shifts to where I am in this chain-like structural hierarchy, to the ground of that phenomena, this is a huge shift in what we call view or emphasis or understanding. And the term that is used for concentrating only on the highest, no matter what world or mode of consciousness is being expressed, this is referred to as pure vision. Pure vision means mind bound to ensof only. It doesn't negate the chain-like structure with the term in Kabbalah for this is Hishtalshalus, the chain of the worlds, the five worlds, with all the spherot in all the worlds and the levels of consciousness that are associated with them that most of your listeners will be familiar with. If you listen to this podcast and if you're listening to a guy like me, chances are you know about five levels of the soul and five worlds, the Hishtalshalus, but chances are you haven't considered that there is a common essentiality of Ensof, in the midst of all these changing levels and degrees of subtlety, these levels and degrees of subtlety are changes in the performance of the divine. But the divine itself is changelessness. The divine itself, Ensof itself, does not change. It can't be reduced to any particular mode of expression, can't be divided, it can't be reified, it can't be put in a category. That changelessness is what it's all about. Either we are about that divine expression and its mystery, or we're just stuck somewhere on the ladder. Even if we're stuck in a very high level of the ladder, it's still reductive and limiting nevertheless. So, When we cultivate the contemplative path, we are essentially cultivating pure vision and the ripening of it through whatever changing states happen to arise. So, your question to me was very interesting. What about the people who are doing this and possibly missing the mark, as we all are to some degree? Well, I would just point them back to that. I would just point them back to the fact that it's all about the divine. It's only about the divine. It's not about cultivating circumstances that are better than other circumstances or higher or lower. It's about finding the essential changeless divine unity that is all pervasive, absolute, and transcendental, regardless of its mode of expression. Hopefully that made sense, Alex. I truly appreciate that, Dave, because it challenges, I know myself and I'm, I'm sure others, to constantly question, why am I approaching something this way? Why am I doing something this way? Why do I value something over something else? And what do I think I'm doing versus the reality of it? And I think that kind of leads to the next question, Dave, which is people are, might be wondering, okay, if I pick up my copy of The Fountain of Wisdom, 
how can I practice this? How can someone go through this? As you mentioned, Dave, there is no step one, then step two, then step three. So how would you recommend a reader actually approach this and navigate through it? Well, the first step would be to care about the issue. You read the introduction and you read words that I wrote about the divine and the nature of reality, the ground of all phenomena, what I've been talking about so far, and you become interested in it. Either you're interested in it or you're not. You know, if you're interested in ceremonial magic and your interest is really to evoke spirits, for example, and that's it, know yourself, know that that's what you want to do. This is different, right? If you become interested in what I'm talking about, that's a decisive kind of interest that is rare. If you have that rare interest in mystical development, well, that's the first thing. Recognize it in yourself. Recognize as a longing or a yearning within yourself. Chances are it was always there. Chances are you were always interested in this, but didn't know what it was. <laughs> so to recognize that you have this interest automatically, it's like a light goes on. And like if you're really interested, you're not going to leave it alone. If you're really interested, you're going to search for it until you hit a wall and then you're going to bang your head against the wall as well you should, because as far as I'm concerned, it is the only thing of value worth being interested in. But that's just me. I'm one of those freaks. If you're a freak too, and you pick up this book and you know that you have this freakish interest that your friends and relatives are not going to understand, then what do you do? Well, there is an actual technique to the use of the book. And with contemplation in general, it involves a couple of steps. One step is reading through the material and not understanding it quickly. And that's very good because you're going to struggle with it. It's not going to intellectually make a whole lot of sense, a text like the Fountain of Wisdom. So what you do is you implant the symbols, like a picture of the symbols in your imagination. And you do that just by reading the text and the commentary through without stopping, not like super fast, like speed reading, but doing it without stopping to struggle, right? You read it through. Then on some level, whatever that level might be, it's in there. It's, it's, it's swimming around in your head. And then you start to take it apart slowly, bit by bit. And if you've read it quickly first, then it's not the first time that you're seeing it when you struggle with it slowly. In that process, there are a number of strategies that take the fire of longing for the divine, which is really an alchemical fire. It's really like a fire and allow that fire to blaze up. And that blazing actually hits a barrier and starts to work on that barrier, which is the limiting function within the mind. Now, the symbol generally alchemically for the mind's fluidity falls under the general category of a mercury, of a mercurial essence. And when it hits its own limitation or hits its own rigidity, it concretizes into what we call a salt. And a salt is a contractive function. So when the blaze of the mind's yearning meets the resistance of the mercury salt, depending on the intensity of the blaze, it can slowly melt that salt away. And as it melts deeper and deeper into its resistances, what was concretized or constricted into the form of a salt starts to become fluid. And then the blaze and the fluidity start to work together. What blazes up and what melts and drips down start to form amalgams of intensity, which create the expanse or the room or the interior space to go further. The deeper the space goes, the deeper the view is expressed and the more fully the view is expressed. So as one struggles with these symbols, the fire of longing is stoked and blazes up and fed by intentionality, by caring, by working with the material. And the more the resistances are melted. So you have melted, dripping fluidity, meeting, burning, bright longing, 
going deeper and deeper and deeper. And this all takes place just as the mind projects itself into these atmospheres, into these textural scenarios with light and darkness mixing with each other into various thicknesses, creating fogs, breaking into points, blazing into flames, creating baths where the mind bathes itself in the burning fluid clarity on various levels, various sheens of color are met with. And the question is, is the mind going somewhere or is this the state of the mind itself? Well, both models are incorrect. There is no mind to go anywhere and there is nowhere to go. This is mystical realization. If we are holding to end Sof alone, the idea of someone going somewhere is out the window because we're talking about the infinite alone. So the basis of all further work is understanding a view which is utterly foreign to the mind and to science and to physics. And that's done simply by intellectually thinking about it. And if you think about it deeply enough, then you start feeling it, right? First, there's intellectual understanding, and then there's feeling resonance. So projecting your mind into intellectual thoughts and then projecting it into deep feeling states allows these forms of patterning to arise. And by patterning, I'm talking about the textures, the atmospheres. The Fountain of Wisdom is humbly suggesting <laughs> that there are these textural fields to be explored by no one nowhere. And the food that allows this to be possible, the fuel for the engine of this is thinking and feeling. So you pour your thinking and feeling into these ambient atmospheric states and hold the view that no matter what arises, it is an expressive display of Ensof. It is the ground of phenomena at all times. The openness, fullness of Ensof, the changeless potentiality of Ensof. So this is mysticism. This, this is really at the core of all forms of mysticism, not just this one. The difference is that the style of mysticism the Fountain of Wisdom offers is largely atmospheric or etheric and fluid. And I hate to use this term because people are going to take it the wrong way, but completely psychedelic, having nothing to do with what psychedelic drugs do. But the imagery is like instantly recognizable as a, as a style of expression. Well, Dave, this leads to the next point because... As an esoteric cartographer, you have these absolutely incredibly powerful and meaningful diagrams and esoteric presentations of these symbol sets. You've done this in previous works that I know many listeners are familiar with. I guess the question would be in the fountain of wisdom, how does your esoteric cartography and diagrams and kind of presentation play a role in how you present the fountain of wisdom. Can you share about any symbol sets or visual representations as well? Oh, Alex, I've been waiting to answer this question for a very long time. That is a great question. In a certain sense, the answer to the question is I've only been diagramming the fountain of wisdom my whole life. I really don't map out anything else but what's in the fountain of wisdom. And there's so many infinite variations of it that it's a life's work. I've given my life to this. And the imagery in my drawings, you could find a place in the fountain of wisdom where it relates, where you could say that this is the root of it in just about every single drawing I've ever done. So mapping out the fountain of wisdom, when I first started, when I saw it and didn't know what the hell to do with it and didn't know what it was and took out a notebook and, and just took the grossest level of it and tried to map it out geometrically into sacred geometry and then categorize the types of textures and then the letter play, there's some letter and number play, but it's not like standard gematria. It's, it's very simple. It just involves the yud and the olive. We can talk about that in a little while as well. But when I just started to make these maps and notebooks, before they turned into actual pictures of the textural atmospheric qualities, I was laying the structural foundation for everything that I would do because I was an artist when I was growing up. 
in the 80s, late 70s, 80s, a few years into the 90s, I was an artist. And then I stopped. I mean, I took 10 years to study and be trained in various lineages, different systems that I digested and didn't make any kind of artwork or mapping or writing or any kind of work creatively at all for 10 years in which I was exploring these things and learning about them, including the work I did with the rabbi who I mentioned earlier and other rabbis as well, as well as occult lineages and forms of training, which have nothing to do with the Jewish world. So when I started with the Fountain of Wisdom and keeping these notebooks and you know, trying to map out or diagram out some kind of sense of, of cohesiveness in this material, what I was actually doing was opening up doorways. For example, simple geometry in which you could pass to explore the textures and the atmospheres. And I'll give you an example. Probably the main one is the quadrisected circle which is the basic foundation for the temple plan of almost every occult ritual. It's essentially a circle on the ground with the cardinal points mapped out, right? East, west, north, south. And then in the middle, you get your altar, generally much of the time in Freemasonry and ceremonial magic and forms of theurgy, this layout is used. So, what's happening in ritual is that people are enacting a basic pattern, a basic geometric structure, which is four points along the periphery of the circle in relation to its center point. Now, there's a great deal of geometry in my books and in my pictures that work off of this pattern. Certainly, ritualists will understand what I'm talking about. But in esoteric cartography, what I chose to do was use that pattern as a doorway, meaning go in, lose yourself and immerse completely in the bath of this aperture. This pattern becomes a means to transmute the mind and have a transposition of dimensions, a dimensional transposition in which one leaves, for example, intellectual ideas and physical reality, which is conceptualized into purely feeling tone realms, past that into pure patterning, which is almost inexpressible. And there is the means for discovery. Now, it's impossible in mysticism to go into deep states where conceptuality is left behind, meaning non-conceptual states of pure texture, and get one's bearings. What happens is that you recalibrate the exploration when you come out of that state, meaning you can't make a diagram from that point of view because there's no such thing as a pencil and there's no such thing as a piece of paper. So, upon... Going back to, I don't want to say normal, but we could say a base level, you start taking the benefit of these explorations and experiences and putting them together. And that's what esoteric cartography does. It, there's a term that's used in the Sefer Yetzirah for this. It's called running and returning. You go so deep that you lose yourself and then you come back and you put the elements together. And then between the running and returning, that's your growth and you make progress as you proceed. So, what I do with the esoteric cartography with the mapping is I just simply take the next step from trying to put together esoteric correspondences in a notebook to trying to create actual sensations that work on the nervous systems of others by using biomorphic means, tonal means, environmental means, having to do with the way the drawings are made, trying to draw it out. Most of the time, I don't understand it until I've produced it. So, a lot of this is non-conceptual or semi-conceptual. And when maps turn into these windows or doorways or pictures, I am no longer the author or the designer or the artist. I don't consider this artwork. It's not personal expression. I'm not. There is no me expressing something. There is nothing to be expressed. So, it's not personal and it's not a form of expression of anything. It is an exploration in and of itself. It's its own experiment. And the best thing I could do is simply just get out of the way 
And then either it happens or it doesn't. I don't understand why it happens or how it happens. But then again, it can't be understood. I don't understand how pure nothingness self-illuminates as lucent clarity, but yet it does. I don't understand how the glow of Ensof manifests its own light, but yet it does. So how does the mind think? What is a thought? What is a perception? These are mysteries. These are not things that can be understood. If you think you understand them, you're going to be wrong. So, you know, I mean, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a person who's trying to constantly relate it to the past. I'm just doing the path. And these maps are the evidence of it. They're the byproducts of it, you could say. I hope that answers your question. That does answer the question, Dave, and that actually leads to something that you've shared on the podcast before. And I know many listeners are familiar with classic alchemical apprehensions of reality and also procedures. For example, the classic turning lead into gold. And I remember, I believe on one of the previous podcasts, you've mentioned that the goal of a contemplative mystic or one of the things that a contemplative mystic uses or apprehends is that there is no changing something from lead into gold. It is simply to realize that everything is already always gold. Everything is already always the case. Is that related, Dave, to what you talk about now in the Fountain of Wisdom with binding oneself to Ein Sof, binding oneself yeah. to, the, to the infinite? Yeah, absolutely. You could say, let's go back to your alchemical analogy. You could say that the transmutation of lead to gold is a misnomer because the lead was always gold from the outset. Sure, that's the view. However, it still appeared as lead and you can't deny that it did. So the fact that you know that the lead is secretly actually gold, that doesn't help you when you see a piece of lead. <laughs> It still looks like lead and you're going to deal with it like lead and accept it as lead no matter what you tell yourself. Because if you tell yourself that the lead is gold, you're going to be in fantasy land until you realize that fact. So, yes, the lead always was gold, always already from primordial beginningless beginning. But you have to realize that you can't just say it intellectually and hold it true as a philosophical precept and expect that to change your reality. Your reality will still be that lead is lead and gold is gold, even though that's not really the case, even if you understand intellectually that that's not the case. So the gold in this scenario is the changeless essential nature of Ensof. The lead in this scenario are the habitual reactions of your mind, of your psychology, of your body mind, your mental states. And you know that the nature of everything, if you hold a view based on unity, divine unity, you know that those fragmentary mental states that appear to be crude, leaden reflections are actually pure, changeless, open lucency and clear light. You could know that, but yet somebody comes up to you and cuts you off in traffic or upsets you emotionally and you're going to react. God damn it. They wronged me and now I'm suffering. Well, that's your lead, right? So you have to deal with reality in a true sense, right? You can't pretend that it's otherwise. You got to deal with it for what it actually is. If it's gold all the time and you found the philosopher's stone, then you don't have to worry or even ask me the question. You just go off and it's joy forever, but that's not the reality for most people. Most people will have to take their actual state, acknowledge the actual qualities, and work with this view that runs seemingly antagonistic to that. To say it's challenging is a ridiculous oversimplification. It pushes every button that we have. You mentioned that, that this book and, and your presentation of the Fountain of Wisdom with commentary, it offers and displays these powerful set of doorways in ways that you say, quote, no other Kabbalistic text comes close to offering, unquote. And so, especially for those listeners, myself included, people who are familiar with, as you mentioned, the Tree of Life and other Kabbalistic texts, what are these Kabbalistic texts, perhaps some very well known? 
what are they missing? Are they too reified? Are they too divisive in terms of categorizing and, and setting everything up? What is what are they? OK, missing? that's a really good question. But rather than answer your question, let me take a part of it and talk about it a little bit. The Kabbalistic texts that most people know about are systems of categorizing phenomena. They're like structural systems for relegating phenomena to a typology. Different qualities fit into different contextual registers in a certain chain. And most Kabbalistic texts are sort of technical categorical systems. And I'm talking here about the spherot and the worlds that everybody knows. What I did in my commentary, knowing pretty much backwards and forwards technical Kabbalah the way that everybody knows it, it's not that hard, right? What I did was I just applied that vocabulary of spherot and categorization to the fountain of wisdom and the esoteric atmospheres. So the fountain of wisdom says something that's seemingly incomprehensible about the nature of clear light breaking down into a fog that dissolves into points and the points burn themselves with their own fire, for example. <laughs> Don't you love that? And what I do is I say, okay, well, on the level of Keter, the Chokmah aspect is doing this. And then when it streams out through its own pipes, you're talking about Chesed protruding towards Gevura in the manner of that. And basically, I go back to the Sphirot that the Fountain of Wisdom doesn't talk about Sphirot. So I put the Sphirot back in there so that everyone can follow it. Because I assume that if people want to know the Sphirot, they read their Arya Kaplan and they take the primitive hermetic Kabbalah a little further, right? So they stop reading whoever the, you know, Llewellyn author is, and they start reading little bits of deeper stuff. And, and gradually they get to know the system pretty well and get pretty fluent with the vocabulary. Once you do that, I'm talking to you, right? Once you do that, we're speaking the same language now. So I'm taking this completely arcane material and putting it back in terms that are I don't want to say common because it's already a highly esoteric language, the language of the spherote, but everybody has access to it. So I use that. My commentary is a spherote commentary. So people can come in and make use of this material. And that's my intention. Mark Verman, the translator of Fountain of Wisdom, is an interesting guy. He made this composite version. It's not a single translation of a single manuscript. It's a composite of different parts of manuscripts. He took the best or most coherent of different parts and put them together so you could get the best sense of what the material is like. And he translated this in 1986. I think it was 1986 or the late 80s, regardless. And he put it out as a short text in a compendium called the Books of Contemplation, which are Iyun school 13th century texts. Now, when I first started making these notebooks, trying to map this stuff out, way before I got my bearings in the use of the text, I got this book. This was my translation, and I read his scholarly discourse on it, and I called him up. I just called him flat out on the phone. I found he taught at some college in Ohio. I <laughs> went to the, the college directory and saw his office hours and just called him sitting there at his desk and said, hi, I'm an insane person. I love this text, and I assume you love it too. And his response was really interesting. He's a scholar. He's an academic He's also an Orthodox rabbi. He's got you know, a PhD from Harvard in the scholarly and academic function of these texts as a historical tradition. And he didn't know what to make of what I was saying. He didn't think that people actually tried to do this stuff because the text doesn't tell you what to do. And to attempt it, you're you're rudderless for the most part. Unlike Lurianic Kabbalah and other forms of Kabbalah that are so common and the methodologies are explicit in the text that one can actually accept that there are modes of practice that are culturally viable and there's provision for the methodologies and growth within them. But since this text is such an anomaly, it doesn't have that stuff. 
he just didn't say anything. And I knew what he was thinking. He was thinking, this guy's crazy. So years went by and I didn't really keep contact with him. I've never actually met him. And then through emails that were exchanged, I told him I was writing down my commentary after 22 years. And I keep in mind, like it's been 22 years, I've been sending him these emails and talking to him and I'm going to make a book out of it. And he said, great, because at that point he realized, well, this guy, he might be nuts, but he's not given up. What he didn't know is that this really overlapped with other forms of mysticism that I've been trained in and that I understand alchemically and in various other ways. And like I had windows into the material that we'd never discussed. So to make a long story short, he said, look, I now believe you, crazy or not, I understand somewhat of what you're trying to do. So he said that he's going to make me a new translation. And that's the one I should put out because it's going to be an improvement over the other one. So he went back to his material from the late 80s, had a second look, thought that he could do it better. And he did. He clarified it a little bit and used better language and didn't really change it, just improved it. And that's the version that I'm putting out in this book. It's a unique new updated translation from this master translator and academic and scholar. And I am saying nothing about its historical use or history in the sense of what had been done with it in the past, previous centuries. I am strictly talking about the work that I have done with it. I'm publishing my data, my results of a lifetime of using it, both in terms of pure practice and esoteric cartography. If you know my pictures, this is the basis of much of it, like we said before. So even if you're not interested in practicing this stuff, if you have any interest in this weird, rare form of exploration, this imagery is going to be so different from anything that you've seen before that I would pretty much hesitate to think you would find anything to compare it to. It's in its own category. It's absolutely unique. The type of imagery, the type of movement that happens with the mind as it negotiates these mental pictures, the psychoetheric symbology, it's in its own category. There's nothing like it. So even just from a point of view of literature, I would imagine it would be interesting what are some of the big things that you want readers to keep in mind or always kind of have running in the background as they are going through this text, as they are engaging in these symbol sets and as they are going deeper and deeper, what should they keep in mind? What are some of the big things that you'd like to leave listeners with so that when they do get their copy, they're fully equipped, so to speak? Really, the only thing that people should keep in mind is a question. And the question starts as, what is this? Meaning, what is reality? When you ask, what is this? Meaning, all of this reality as it's presented, you have the aspect of the knowing of all of this, the knowing of reality, and those qualities or the phenomena that becomes known. So, you have ordinary knowing predicated on a perceiving subject and perceived states or objects or object states, whether they're internal or external. So what knows and what is known, you could lump it all together with just the term reality, all of this. What is it? What is its nature? What is happening? I mean, that's the only question that should be asked about anything. It's the only question that makes any sense. What, who, and how, and when these come and go. But the question of reality is an unanswerable question that only comes to be explored by direct immersion and interface. Meaning the only way to answer the question, what is all of this? What is reality? Is immersion in reality. The deeper you immerse, the more intimate the investigation becomes ultimately that which investigates and that which is investigated dissolve together into a 
unity, a cohesive ground, a continuum. And that's not the end. That's only the beginning. So what you should keep in mind as you're exploring this material is what is reality? The question of reality. If this bores you, if this is not interesting to you, then it's not something you're going to find fruitful. And that's most people. I mean, let's face it. When we're really talking about this kind of exploration, you're talking about such a minority of a group that is already esoteric, <laughs> that even most esotericists are not going to, a little light is not going to go off when they hear these words. So if for the few freakish outcasts, <laughs> when I say what is reality, either they are completely inflamed by that prospect or, you know, or I don't know what to tell you. For those few, Dave, for those few who really are interested in contemplative mysticism, in the fountain of wisdom and actually, you know, working and engaging in and immersing and delving into this specific contemplative mystical path, where can they pick up a copy of your book? Can they pre-order it? We will certainly make sure to link to your website, davidheimsmith.com. But can you tell us about, for those who are interested, where can they uh, pick up a copy or pre-order? Well, I am putting it out myself. The project of my own publishing is called The Lightning Flash of Olive, and I sell it through my website. And I've put out multiple volumes, this being the what is going to be the fourth volume of the Lightning Flash of Olive series. And one volume is sold out. Volume two is sold out. Volume three is almost sold out. So the different volumes that I have available are all sold through my website. So you can get it from me. My wife, uh, Rachel, runs the book sales and we can sell it to you. You could also get it from JD Holmes. You could also get it from, I don't know, Amazon. All you got to do is Google the book. You see, this is another thing I should mention. The Fountain of Wisdom has never been published under its own name. This is the first time that the Fountain of Wisdom under its own name has been translated and published into English or any language, as far as I know, other than manuscripts. So, if you go looking for it, I mean, it shouldn't be that hard. Is there anything else, Dave, that we have not discussed yet or anything else that you'd like to leave listeners with about either the Fountain of Wisdom or contemplative mysticism? Yeah, the third volume of this Lightning Flash of Olive series that I put out is a book called The 32 Keys, and it's based on 32 separate diagrams that I publish as a, a deck of cards, like a deck of tarot cards, the same kind of form. They're separate. They're not bound into a book. And there's a book that accompanies it that explains them. This 32 key project is the overview of a system. It's the way that I handle the issue of the Kabbalistic symbol system as a working unit. So if you want to know where I'm coming from, with my analysis of Fountain of Wisdom, which is going to be pretty advanced stuff and complex, and you want to start to see the Spherot and Kabbalah the way that I'm talking about it, I highly recommend that book, The 32 Keys, because it's an overview of the path from my point of view. So you could say that it's sort of like a prerequisite for Fountain of Wisdom, if you if you need one, if you if you want to get tight enough with the system that we're speaking the same language. That's the way to do it. Cannot thank you enough. Author, contemplative mystic, esoteric cartographer, David Heimsmith. David, thank you so much for just taking the time and sharing about the Fountain of Wisdom on the podcast today. Thank you so much, Alex. It's always a pleasure to come on Glitch Bottle. Wow. I definitely hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Dave's thoughts on the fountain of wisdom are psychedelic in the most powerful sense of the word. He challenges us to always ask, what is reality? How can we bathe our own minds and contemplative practice to break through to new layers of meaning? Plus, this is such a rare text, the fountain of wisdom, that it really was an honor to have Dave back on the podcast to discuss it. 
Also, a huge thank you to each and every patron of Glitch Bottle on Patreon. You help keep the lights on and take the show in new and interesting ways. And if you'd like to support the podcast and also check out bonus content or videos and you can ask questions for guests, check out Glitch Bottle on patreon.com slash glitch bottle. For instance, uncommon patrons can hear David talk about his daily routine and contemplative mysticism and so much more. And as always, you can subscribe to Glitch Bottle on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. As always, this is Alexander Eth reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Keep the light.